Hello YouTube. Uh, now, I want to take a look at uh, another truth tree method. Um, so far we've been using truth trees where we actually draw the worlds around our formulas uh, and that method is found in uh, James Garson's Modal Logic for Philosophers. Um, as far as I'm aware though, this isn't really the, the sort of orthodox way of doing truth trees. Um, the, the more common method that I've seen involves sort of numbering the worlds and then tracking them on each formula. Um, it's worth being aware of it and it's not really substantially different so I want to take a quick look at it. Uh, you can find it in um, Priest's Introduction to Non-Classical Logics or uh, Rob Girl's Modal Logics and Philosophy uh, for two examples. Okay, so the, um, the propositional rules are all exactly the same. Um, the main difference is that we're not drawing any worlds, we're no longer drawing worlds, and uh, our rules for the modal operators are different. So the first thing to note is that after each formula we write the name of the world it inhabits. So let's say we have our two formulas uh, here, we've got uh, uh, say necessarily x, where uh, x is a number specifying a world. Um, when we branch a formula the numbers stay the same. So if we have a or b zero, then we branch into a zero and b zero. The black here represents what you start with, red represents what you derive. Uh, it's quite simple. So um, all, all the propositional rules are exactly the same, except you just write um, these numbers after each formula. The modal rules are what's uh, important here. So let's say we have um, possibly a x, so x is some number representing a world. Now um, in our previous tree method, if we had uh, possibly a, we would open up a new world. So how do you sort of open up a new world here? Well we simply write the relation. Um, so from possibly a x, we derive that x relates to some other world y, and so we write that, and these, this, is, this would be 0r1 for example, um, and then we write a y, so we've got possibly a x, x r y a y. I think this is perfectly intuitive, uh, and it's, I mean, it's easily translatable into our previous tree form. So just consider our previous tree form. We have some world x in which there is uh, possibly a, and from this we draw a new arrow to a new world, and in that world we put a, right? And that, that arrow there just represents the x r y. So this is quite obvious, I think. How about necessity? Let's say we have necessarily a x. Well, uh, in our previous tree method, we can do nothing until our world accesses some other world. So that is uh, until we've already got an arrow and a new world. Um, in this tree method, I think you could probably work out that we do nothing unless we already have x, r, y on our tree. So once we've got necessarily a x and we've got x, r, y, then we derive a, y. In our previous tree form it would look like this. So um, quite simple there. Um, the, uh, the equivalences between necessarily not and not possibly and also between not necessarily and possibly not, all, they, all those uh, remain which means we can add these rules um, as, just as we did for our previous uh, tree method. Uh, remember we're not really changing any rules here, we're just changing the notation um, th so these are our four rules for our modal operators and it's all, it's all exactly the same as it was last time, we're just uh, using a different kind of notation. Um, uh, as usual, uh, you should apply non-branching rules before branching rules and you should apply the propositional rules before opening new worlds. Um, oh, and I'll, I'll just mention, I'm sure this is obvious to you, uh, contradictions obtain when you have some formula ax followed by not ax uh, where, where x is the same number. Uh, if you have say a1 and not a sorry a0 and not a1 that's not a contradiction okay it's only a contradiction when they're the same number again I'm sure that that's all quite obvious um, right then well uh, 
let's get on with it then. I think we should do some truth trees. Um, so let's take this argument here, um, which we've we've seen this argument before. It's the distribution axiom. Uh, we already know it's valid. Uh, which remember this is our semantic consequence symbol. So we we have here that um, this just means our argument is a consequence in K of the uh, empty set. So first of all, we assume its negation and we write zero after it. Uh, we're dealing with a false conditional, so we have a true antecedent and a false consequent. Uh, here again, we have another false conditional. So um, again, true antecedent, false consequent. And uh, you might notice that we've now exhausted all of our propositional rules. Um, as for the modal rules, uh, well, we've got necessity, necessity, and then we have a not necessarily here. And that's that's the only thing we can do at this point. Um, and that's use this not necessarily to open up a new world. So we write uh, 0R1 to represent that there is some world 1 accessible from world 0. And then we write not q1. Okay, pretty simple. And now that since we have 0 r1, we can use our necessity operators. We can derive uh, we can derive p and if p then q um, in that in that world. And then we have a true conditional here, so we uh, we can branch into a uh, false antecedent true consequent, both of which are contradictions. So there we have our tree. Um, I think that's pretty simple. I mean, uh, you know, I don't really think there's anything too difficult here if you if you've already mastered the other kind of tree method. But I do find personally that these trees are not quite as pleasing to the eye as the uh, previous ones. And I don't I don't think they kind of capture possible worlds in such an intuitive way. You know, you're not actually they don't have that visual element. But uh, they're good they're good things to be aware of. Okay, I'd like to take another argument now. If possibly P or possibly Q, then possibly P or necessarily Q. False conditional. Uh, that's a false conditional there. We're assuming the negation, so we've got true antecedent, false consequent. Then we have um, here, we have a false disjunction. So that means that both disjuncts are false. Okay, and then we have this true disjunction, which means we have to um, branch, and on each branch we assume each disjunct, so we've got possibly P, possibly Q. Um, well, now what? Uh, well, now we have to start using our modal rules, and uh, let's focus first on this left branch here. So we've got uh, not necessarily Q, we can use that, uh, uh, and we could open our, our branch with that. Um, and we've got possibly p. I just want to sort of do a bit of a bit of forward thinking here. You see, I mean, I think you you know you should be able to kind of sort of work this this one out. It's look, we have here a possibly p, so we could open a new world with possibly p, or we could open a new world with not necessarily q. But uh, look look here, we've also got not possibly p, which means that when we open our new world, we know we're going to put not p in it. So um, clearly we should open a new world with possibly p because once we do that we can put not p in it and derive a contradiction and close the branch pretty quickly on the other hand if we open up uh, the world with not necessarily q we'd have to put not q then not p then we'd have to open up another world for the possibly p um, you know there's just no point going through all of that we know that we can derive a contradiction we can use one less world um, in general, it's it's a good idea to keep your eye open for things like this. So let's yeah, let's use the possibly p. We've got possibly p, so zero r one p, and then we use not possibly p to derive a contradiction. If if you can see that you can easily derive a contradiction, just do it. You don't need to go through the whole uh, rigmarole. You know, you don't need to you don't need to do everything that you could do. If you can derive a contradiction, the branch is closed. So if you can find a contradiction earlier, the tree will be much quicker and less cumbersome. Um, right then, so that's uh, that's that branch closed. Now we have possibly Q. Well, let's uh, let's open up a new world and derive uh, Q. So we've got zero R one Q. Um, 
But now what? What do we do now? Well, we have our uh, uh, not possibly p here, so we can put that in a new world as not p. Um, but that's that's about all we can do with that one. We've got not necessarily q here, and this rule requires that we open up a new world. And since this formula is uh, not necessarily q zero, we write zero r two, and we put not q in two. You see, this was with this possibly q, we had to write zero r one one being a new world and then that's from the world zero uh, but this is also this not necessarily q is also in world zero and we're opening up a new world so we write zero r two um, that gives us a new world two accessible from world zero and you'll notice now that that's it there's nothing more we can do yet our tree is open so our argument is invalid um, we can check it with a counterexample in the usual manner. Ignore the left branch because it's a contradiction. Uh, so we have three worlds, W0, W1, W2, such that uh, W0 accesses W1 and it accesses W2. In W2, Q is false, P is also false because it doesn't appear. Uh, in, in W1, Q is true, not uh, P is false, so we've got not P and Q. And in W0, both P and Q are false. I think it's quite obvious that this works. Um, so possibly P or possibly Q. Well, Q must be possible because it obtains in W1, and W1 is accessible from W0. So yes, we, we have possibly Q, that's true, which means our disjunction, possibly P or possibly Q, must be true. Um, as for possibly P or, or necessarily Q, well, in neither world, is P true, so possibly P is not true, and since there is a world at which Q isn't true, um, Q isn't true in W2, well necessarily Q isn't true either. So possibly P is not true and necessarily Q is not true, so this disjunction here is also not true, which means, um, you can easily see, this, this gives us a model on which um, our First, the first part of the conditional is true, the second part false, which of course uh, means that this is false. This, is, this argument is not a consequence of k. Well, I hope that was uh, fairly simple. I don't think there was anything too difficult there. You know, counterexamples, they all, everything works in the same way. It's, it's all done the same way. You, you know, it's just that the notation is a little bit different, that's all. Um, I'm uh, going to leave you with these exercises here. Um, yeah, some of them are valid, I think some of them are invalid. So uh, just try uh, try using both kinds of truth tree, um, the ones in this video and in and in the last. I'm actually not sure. Are, are some of them valid? I I don't remember if I uh, checked that actually. Um, well, anyway, n never mind. They might all be invalid. Um, for, for the invalid arguments, try to read off the counter examples um, and and everything. And then in the uh, the next videos, in we'll be looking at some alternative systems of uh, modal logic. Some well, not necessarily alternative, but just some systems of modal logic beyond the system K. And uh, in my opinion, it gets very interesting at that point. Um, so that's that. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.